Hey everyone, welcome to APTA Student Night. My name is Lindsay Durand, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Student Assembly Director of Communications. Tonight's topic is on starting a cash-based physical therapy practice, and we'll be having a panel discussion with our guests who have done some fantastic work in developing successful businesses as out-of-network providers. Tonight we are joined by Dr. Sarah Reardon, Carlos Ferrio, and Keaton Wright. And I will give our guests an opportunity to introduce themselves and explain a little bit about their practices in a minute. But first, for everyone tuning in live, go ahead and introduce yourself in the comments. Tell us what year you are in PT school, if you're a PT, PTA, uh, where you go to school and where you're tuning in from. We'd love to get to know you. We have members of the Student Assembly Board of Directors engaging with everyone in the comments. So we would love to hear where you're from. So go ahead and share a little bit about yourself in the comments. If you'd like to spread the word about this event, tell people what you think and continue the conversation afterwards, go ahead and use the hashtag APTA Live. You can also follow us on social media. You'll find us on Twitter at APTA Students and on Facebook and Instagram at APTA Student Members. And if you have any questions throughout this discussion, please drop them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them when we get around to it. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts throughout too, so feel free to share those in the comments as well. Um, this is a open discussion and we are excited that you are tuning in and we are excited to have our guests here. So let's get to know our panelists. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with Dr. Sarah Reardon. So Sarah, do you think you could give us an introduction? Tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. Hello everyone. My name is Sarah Reardon. I am a pelvic floor physical therapist in New Orleans, Louisiana. I own a small private practice that specializes in pelvic health physical therapy for all genders. We have been open for about three years. I graduated from Washington University in 2007 and started pelvic health right at the start of my career. And this is all that I've done. And in the recent years have started my um, my private practice and then also have online digital courses and a pelvic floor and pregnancy fitness program. I am very excited to join all of you today, answer questions that you have and really talk about why I love the ability to have a private practice, a cash-based practice and how that is working in the field of pelvic health. Thank you, Sarah. Next up, Keaton, do you wanna give us an introduction? Tell us a little bit about yourself um, and how you started Movement X. Sure. Hi, everybody. I am Dr. Keaton Ray. I live in Portland, Oregon. Went to Duke PT School in North Carolina, graduated in 2014, and then came out here uh, for my internships and loved it and have been here ever since. I was in a traditional outpatient orthopedic clinic for about four years where I got my OCS and my clinical instructor certification and all sorts of other continuing education, at which point I realized I really needed to provide a higher level of care to my patients. And so I realized that movement happens not just in the clinic, but where it matters most to patients, which is on the sports field, in their home, at their training facility, at work, et cetera, et cetera. So in 2018, my business partner, Josh D'Angelo, who is in Washington, D.C., and I founded Movement X. And over the last three years, we've grown Movement X to about 10 states now with about 40 physical therapists. Thank you, Keaton. And last but not least, we have Carlos. Carlos, do you want to give us an introduction? Tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. Sure. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Carlos Barrio. Uh, I own Spark Physiotherapy. We're based out of Alexandria, Virginia. I graduated from Marymount University in 2009. I uh, had a uh, full-time personal training, strength and conditioning business uh, upon entering PT school, and I did that full-time through my education. Uh, and then I opened up Spark Physiotherapy as a rebrand of our personal training company uh, right away in 2009. I did work at a PT mill, a typical physical therapy setting, uh, doing mostly orthopedics, uh, for about a year and a half in conjunction with my work at Spark. Uh, about a year and a half in, uh, as my demand uh, began to increase for my own time, uh, seeing people one-on-one -on -one for 60 minutes of treatment in my facility, uh, I was able to uh, pare away the schedule from the mill, and I've been doing it full-time ever since. So uh, it's just a terrific way to uh, connect with patients and uh, believe we can deliver the kind of quality care that a more discerning health-seeking community is looking for. And thank you, Carlos. So like I said, we are going to have a panel discussion tonight with our three guests. They all have 
fantastic private practice, cash-based physical therapy practices, um, but they all do slightly different things. They all have different experiences and they all have a different why. So that leads me actually to my first question, which is what is the driving factor that led you to start your own practice? Carlos, do you wanna go ahead and start? Sure. Um, you know, the biggest thing was uh, in my personal training career, uh, I was seeing people 60 minutes at a time. They were paying me out of their pocket to do so. And I didn't think that there was any need to change that kind of quality one-on-one -on -one, uh, alliance that we were building uh, just because I was performing physical therapy services. Um, so uh, having to do that uh, in the setting that we were, that I was working in, uh, in conjunction with starting my own clinic, I felt sort of cheated. I felt like I wasn't being able to give the attention uh, that I wanted to each individual. And uh, man, that was just a, just solidified the idea that I had um, to take that model of being able to provide service one-on-one, -on -one, accept cash payments, uh, assist with billing if it's uh, necessary. But the why was just to provide that one-on-one -on -one, uh, hospitality, that welcoming environment, and the patient client centric focus, uh, whether it was on, you know, a post-op, uh, post-op client, or it was somebody who wanted to improve their performance in sports, um, you know, whatever it was they wanted when they walked in the door, I wanted to be able to give them that the most full attention, um, with my time. Absolutely. Sarah, what about you? So I've been in pelvic health for the entirety of my career, and it's always been one-on-one -on -one treatments, hour-long sessions, and I feel like I have been spoiled as a physical therapist to be able to do that. And it's one of the reasons that I really love pelvic health and women's health because I'm able to work one-on-one, -on -one, not multitask, and that's just really how I work best. Um, but when I started my clinic three years ago, I was also working at a hospital and long hours. I had two young children, and I just found myself feeling like I can't take care of my family the way I want to take care of myself and meet the demands of what a hospital needs for my time. So I started seeing people in the back of a yoga studio one day a week, and then it become two days a week just by word of mouth. And it eventually grew. And then just even four months later, I started a lease at a clinic and now we have a team of four and it's three years later. So I think for me, it, um, Again, I want to be able to maintain the, the quality of care. I think I echo what Carlos said a lot is that I feel like there's something that we can offer. And when I feel like I'm just kind of it's a revolving door of patients, which has been the case in, in larger settings with high demands and high productivity um, requirements, I, I've really struggled to be able to do that. Um, the other thing is I needed a lot of flexibility in my life. So, you know, the seasons of my life changed. I now had a family and young children, and I wanted to be able to take off a day here or work certain days of my schedule here. And so, you know, everything kind of really came together. And I, you know, I was a one person shop. I didn't have the ability to have a billing person for insurance and do all of this. So I just started cash base and realized I can see half as many people and make the same amount of money and offer still amazing quality of care. And I think that's kind of going to be a consistent theme that comes up throughout the night is what can these type of practices provide in terms of quality care? And that seems to be a focus um, so far, at least for Carlos and Sarah. Keaton, we'll hear what you have to say in terms of your uh, the driving factor that led you to start Movement X. Sure. There are so many factors, honestly. The, the why has extrapolated over the last four years, but the why started because we knew there had to be a better way to provide healthcare and not just physical therapy necessarily, but healthcare in general. I mean, we all see the writing on the wall with insurance reimbursement just plummeting with overhead costs going up. It's harder to make margins in the physical therapy clinic traditionally. And so ultimately what that leads to is burnout for the provider and poor quality outcomes for the patient. And that's not a hard and fast rule. There's clinics with great settings, but um, in general, as insurance squeezes our healthcare system, it's going to lead to a, a less productive system for the provider and the patient. So Josh, my co-founder, and I saw the writing on the wall, and we knew there had to be a better way for both providers and patients. And so we started Movement X to prove a certain model of care. If we can go one-on-one -on -one with patients, if we can focus on outcomes, if we can take healthcare to the place that matters most to patients, we can result in better lives, quality of lives for the patient. And then we can take that model and we can extrapolate it to insurance companies. We'll say, okay, you're paying us pennies to treat patients for 
15 minutes, 30 minutes, if you're lucky, 45 minutes. And this is what's happening long term. If you pay us higher wages to treat in a better quality setting, what can we then do to save you money long term with this patient? So our goal with our out of network model or what we're calling here a cash based model is to actually prove a system of quality care works so that we can improve the entire healthcare system long term. I think that's absolutely like so interesting to think about in terms of what are we doing to elevate the profession of physical therapy by providing these the, this type of physical therapy service? And then what can we do to actually change the way that we provide healthcare? And so I love that all three of you have these aspects built into your why, into the reasons behind starting a cash-based clinic. Because I think all of us as students get into PT thinking we're going to provide the best quality care mm -hmm for patients, you know, you like go through all the schooling, you spend all this time and money to be a good PT, to get into a clinic that doesn't actually allow you to do that sometimes. And that's based on productivity, like Keaton mentioned, reimbursement rates often. And you're not always in the setting where you can provide the best quality patient care. Um, and for students that have a lot of, you know, loan debt, it's, it's hard. You want to take a job that's going to pay well and Sometimes that's in a setting that requires you to see, you know, 15 to 20 patients a day. And then it's like, what are you what are you trading? Um, so just I love hearing all of your all of your whys and your reasons for starting your practices, because I think there are so many reasons to start a cash based practice um, or kind of take this route in physical therapy that is going to really elevate the profession. Uh, for all of our students that are tuning in live or maybe people that have an interest in starting a cash based or out of network PT practice one day, what do you think is necessary for that? What skills, experience, what like how much money do you think you need to actually get started on this? Um, Keaton, do you think you could take the lead on this? Sure. Yeah. I mean, anyone can do it. You know, a lot of times business seems intimidating. And I'll say when we started Movement X, we had no formal business training whatsoever. So we, I went to Duke and Duke had a great business segment, but it in no way is sufficient to start your own business. Um, and so the number one thing, if you are going to go after your own business, is just to get mentors, mentors all around you, reach out to people on webinars like this, sign up for the private practice section, go knock on local networking doors in your area and just have people who know the infrastructure of business because you're not going to be able to do it on your own right off the bat. And then the second thing is clinical expertise. You really, really, really want to make sure that if you're charging cash for your services, you're able to return on that value. Otherwise, you know, the, the patient is going to be really hard to keep patients. Carlos, go for it. You look ready oh, to answer this. I'm ready. Uh, so uh, terrific points, all of them. Um, I wanted to make sure people understood that if this is something that you wanted to embark upon, um, you don't need to write, okay, this is going to sound blasphemous for especially the business MBA folks in the room. You don't need a business plan. You don't need to beg a bank for a big loan. You don't need a monstrous facility. You don't need um, tons of equipment. Um, the office that I sit in where I write emails and nonsense blog posts is larger than the clinic I started in. Um, 13 years ago or where it was, um, you really must um, be okay at this stuff, right? You have to be pretty good at this. Uh, adequate is the word I usually use, but you do need to be better than adequate. And um, I, I know that there are folks out there who um, are practicing physical therapy that probably would belong in a mill, frankly. Um, but if you want to be able to provide the kind of service and, ex and for people to expect value when they see you, you do have to really get... Um, serious about the kind of clinician that you are. But that's, I think if you're at, at that level where you want to start this kind of thing, that's almost a given. So I, I say that that adequate line is is high, but um, uh, keeping overhead low should be everyone's biggest challenge. Um, whether you partner with a yoga studio like Sarah did, uh, whether you um, partner with a CrossFit gym like I've recommended some folks uh, do. Uh, in my case, I, um, secured space in a shared office space. Uh, there are these kinds of places all over. Every city in the country has them. Uh, and you might be next door to a, a lawyer and a moving company and a cookie baker, and that's all fine. Um, whatever you do to keep margins uh, manageable 
uh, while you're growing, especially early on, is probably the most important bit. Um, but I have consulted with a lot of students and, and actually just physical therapists who have been in the field and are, are really feeling disenfranchised that this is not what they want, they signed up for. And they said, well, what do I do to start? And they, they show me this big business plan and I have a mission statement and I started a website. And I think, man, you're just doing a lot of work for kind of nothing right now. Like, get a client, get a bed, stick it in your car, buy a couple of kettlebells and go. Start charging people cash for what you do and kick ass at it. Do a good job. Make that person feel valued. Make that person feel cared for. That person will tell someone else. Um, Instagram's great. Websites are awesome. It's all terrific. But, and there's a certain point at which you need to um, start thinking about a space. Maybe that person who uh, you're renting space out of their in, in their yoga studio needs that space now. Maybe you're getting busy. Your clients are now filling their weight room. Um, that is terrific. That's a great little place to be, but it is a, a challenge that a lot of folks face when they partner with another company who has their own goals, visions, um, their own idea of what our business is like to run. So, um, you know, when you come to that moment, you still want to take into account, well, what's this going to cost? Do I bring in the revenue right now to cover another bit of rent, uh, another table, maybe bringing somebody on as a contractor. Um, those are very important things that I want to just make, uh, make sure I, I give Sarah enough time to answer too. Um, but yeah, uh, if you could work to keep overhead low, that is probably the most important bit. Um, and be a really kick-ass therapist, frankly. You got to be good at this stuff. Awesome. Thank you. I think you brought up a lot of really great points in terms of how can you how can you start this practice, especially if you don't have a lot of money to start the practice, which I think is a, a big worry um, for a lot of new grads or people looking to start a cash-based PT practice. Um, Carlos mentioned a business plan. I have a 65-page business plan due tomorrow for my <laughs> class. So I know the struggles. I'm like, I put a lot of work and effort into this like mission statement and the vision and like our marketing <laughs> and the rest of the team did a lot more. Um, but yeah, going through and like, you think you need a business plan and all of this stuff. And you're like, we need a $150,000 loan to start this. Right. Right. Exactly. And I'm like, we'll never start this practice. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's great to hear that you don't need, you know, necessarily a lot of money. You just need to be good at what you do. You need to have the passion. You need to have the drive. Um, and you, you do need the clinical experience. Sarah, what do you think um, is necessary for starting your own cash PT practice? Yeah, I mean, I really, everything Carlos was saying, I was shaking my head. I have been a board certified women's health clinical specialist for 10 years. And I had, I knew my craft and I was good at my craft. And I felt really confident that I was giving the best quality of care, even when I was in a private practice setting, even when I, when I was in a hospital-based setting. So I knew that I was giving good care and I had gotten to the point where it's like, I feel like I know this field well. And then when I went to start a business, it was kind of learning a new field. It was, you know, learning how to start a business and open a business and a business bank account and insurance and, and just really start from the bottom and so I wasn't as worried about like am I being a good physical therapist because I knew that I was offering the best quality care that I could um, but really kind of thinking about now how do I be the best business owner that I can be and so I mean I think being a really a great clinician and having your skill set down if we're going to charge people the a cash-based practice and you know these are their hard-earned dollars these are this is their time away from their families, away from their jobs. I want to make sure that I am offering great care if I'm going to be, you know, accepting that from them. And I have, you know, every bit of faith that that is what we're doing at our, at our clinic here in New Orleans. Um, and the second thing is you always have to know your why. I mean, I love what I do. I love being a physical therapist, but I love my field of pelvic health specifically. And so when you're going to be a business owner, you are doing everything from mopping the floors you know, making the bank runs, treating the patient, answering the phones in the beginning. I am also a fan of bootstrapping. So like minimal overhead. Um, there's a book I read that's pretty old now, but it's called The Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki. And that was kind of my takeaway was like, keep your overhead really low because if you want a proof of concept before you go take out a huge loan or, or take out a lease on a big space. And so um, those are kind of some of the, the tools that I use and, and still use today. Absolutely. And I just think like all of you brought up great reasons um, or great things that are necessary to starting a cash based PT practice. Like if we're really trying to do a service to our patients, we need to have some 
you know, some level of expertise, knowledge, passion, we need to know that what we are providing is going to be valuable to our patients. Um, I heard this great quote the other day for cash-based PT, you're competing on value. You're not competing on price because if you were competing on price, they would be going to the cheaper PT clinic. So as cash-based PT providers or out-of-network providers, how do you educate your patients on the value of your services? How do you prove to them basically that you are providing value, that you are worth what they are paying for you? Sarah, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. And, you know, I really think of it not as just value. I really think of it as experience. So I really think about the customer experience, everything from if they email me, how long is it taking for them to get an email back from a clinician? How long does it take for them to get their phone call returned? How easy is it for them to schedule? What is it my clinic look like when they walk in? You know, everything that they experience from the start of making that decision to come in to following up with them after their sessions. And if they haven't come in, checking in, remembering their names and the names of their kids. I mean, it's really an experience that I want them to feel like they're not just getting value, but they're getting like care in a way that you just can't get when you're at a place that is just the revolving door. And so I think about all of those things and how can we really optimize that? And um, because it is something that, you know, even if you, it's value, it, it's kind of just like, but some people are just, you know, strapped for dollars or strapped for time. But I think what I can do in four one hour sessions, they may go to another clinic three times a week for six weeks. And and that's not the way that, that we kind of work. So it, it's kind of the whole experience I think about that, again, I really value what people are investing in their health. I think it takes a lot for someone to pick up the phone, especially in the field of pelvic health to say, okay, now I'm ready to, to, to take care of this. And so I wanna make sure that I'm doing everything on my end to help follow through with that and they see the value um, of their, their dollars. Yeah, I think that's great. Like describing it as an experience as opposed to just like the value of this product, because ideally we're really, we're providing something different to patients in terms of we can educate them, we can really give them the tools um, you know, that insurance sometimes doesn't reimburse for. So I think we are providing more of this entire experience as opposed to just like one product. So I like that you you mentioned that, Sarah. Keaton, what are your um, what are your thoughts? How do you show your patients the value in your services? Sure. So I'm going to uh, just so you don't get three of the same answers, because I 100 percent agree with Sarah and what I assume Carlos is also going to say uh, the experience is everything. You guys, if you haven't looked already, there's a wonderful podcast about Airbnb's founder, Brian Chesky, about the 11 star Airbnb experience, which has become a very common term in Movement X is the 11 star experience. So look, look it up. <laughs> we can also share the podcast for you to share later, Lindsay. Um, but I think a, a bigger thing that's often underlooked with cash pay practices is how you actually really can collaborate with the insurance company to still get you a high margin as a PT, but decrease the cost of the patient for the patient. So if you collect cash from the patient, you can give them what's called a super bill. There's a standard template for a super bill. The patient submits that to their insurance. Our company verifies their out of network benefits before they ever see care with us. So they know exactly what they're paying and what they're getting reimbursed. Once they submit that super bill, then the patient can get reimbursed directly by the insurance company. Also, when you are out of network with certain limitations, you do have to be careful when you're structuring your pricing, you have some structural flexibility in what you're charging people. So you can offer single session rates, you can offer a discounted package in a bundle, you can offer a sliding scale fee schedule for economically disadvantaged. So what Movement X is doing is we are basically structuring ways that allows access to cash-based healthcare for all segments of the economic population so that it's not just, you know, $175 per hour because we know that's not going to serve the entire world and help the entire world move better. So in this cash-based setting, you do have a lot of flexibility that can help offload the patient. Carlos, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, uh, just to touch on the specifics of the word value in this proposition. Um, and so uh, terrific points made by both ladies. Um, but if you think about a hypothetical, and this is one I throw out to a lot of new grads and people who are thinking about this as, a, as an option. Um, if you, let's say, charge $100 an hour, it's $100 for 60 minutes of your time. 
that same person can go to a PT mill and probably pay their $50 copay, but see the clinician for 10, 15, 20 minutes. And, you know, there's a range in that. Um, but let's call it an average of 15 minutes if you're seeing four patients in an hour, and that's not atypical. That person paying just their copay of $50 is actually paying $200 an hour to see that clinician in that 15 minute slot. Now, if, not, if nothing else, like let's say their time is not worth it to them, it, you know, they'll just pay the money, that's fine. Um, but in short, any one of us here and anybody who's running cash uh, out of network, fee for service, whatever you wanna call kind of PT setting, um, is working within a stone's throw of a bunch of mills, all of which will just bill your insurance. And if the work wasn't at least as good, if not likely better, all of us will be out of business very rapidly. So there's something to be said about people who come back, people who tell their friends, uh, but from a purely value standpoint, we're actually not much more expensive. We're just differently costed. So that's something to take into account when you're uh, explaining this to potential clients and, and friends and neighbors who are gonna help you market your, your facility or your business. Yeah, I think you all bring up a lot of really great points. Um, it is, like we had been saying kind of since the beginning, it's more about the experience um, and there's ways to build that experience and there's ways to still provide cash PT services to people who may not have the funds to, to pay out of pocket for every single visit at full price. Um, and we provide value in ways that are slightly different. So at this time, we're actually going to take a short break for some announcements. Um, we'll give our guests a couple minutes to grab a drink, go to the bathroom, whatever they need. Um, and they will be back. But in terms of announcements, we have a couple announcements here. So CSM material is available for viewing through March 31st. So if you registered for CSM, be sure to check out that content. Um, the end of March also ends our Reach 100 challenge. So if your PT or PTA program has 100% APTA membership, you will be eligible for the APTA telehealth core certificates course. So be sure to check out all the details on that and reach 100. Our APTA student socials are now available for viewing on YouTube. We had one this past Tuesday with Dr. Adrian Lowe on pain science education, and it was absolutely phenomenal. We really hope that you will join us for future socials. So if you're interested and you wanna learn what is this all about, be sure to check out our previous socials now available on our YouTube channel. National Advocacy Dinners um, and National Advocacy Season is coming up. And so we will kick off our National Advocacy Dinner Season on May 4th which, with our virtual NAD happening with all of APTA. If you would like to host your own National Advocacy Dinner, you can sign up on APTA Engage and the Advocacy Project Committee can help you with supplies, can help you with setting everything up, getting you speakers. Um, it's a really great experience and opportunity to advocate for your patients and teach other students and PTs about ways to advocate. So if you are interested, be sure to head to APTA Engage to sign up to host one. Additionally, core ambassador applications are open. So I believe we have 26 spots available. Over half of the core ambassador positions are available. So be sure to check that out. Um, being a core ambassador is a great way to stay engaged in your profession. And again, teach everyone about all of the great ways that APTA can benefit you as a student. Our last announcement here is that applications for Student Assembly Board of Directors will open on May 1st. So if you are interested in learning more, please contact our nominating committee. They are all present on this live. So we have Gustavo, Teo, and Patrick. Um, if you're interested, we would love to talk more to you about running for Student Assembly Board of Directors, what all that entails, all of the positions available. So be watching for more information about that. Like I said, applications will open on May 1st. All right, so we will go ahead and bring back our panelists and continue our discussion on cash-based PT. So before our break, Keaton brought up a really great point um, that not everyone can always access cash PT services. Sometimes they're expensive um, and they almost seem like a luxury to a lot of people, especially if you're paying a lot for your insurance, like you're paying a big premium, you have a deductible, like you wanna utilize your insurance. Um, so I think a lot of people have this perspective that as out-of-network providers, you're actually reducing accessibility to patients. 
So can all of you talk a little bit about what you have done to kind of negate that um, increased accessibility for your patients, maybe with a sliding scale or other methods? Um, Sarah, do you want to start? Sure. So um, I have a pretty robust Instagram account. It's called The Vagina Whisperer. And honestly, I offer so much free education there. And it's just general things that I don't even think we should have to pay for because it should be common pelvic health knowledge. Um, and so it does not at all replace physical therapy, but I at least, I think it helps people to start thinking like, could this be something that's helpful for me? Or I didn't even know there was pelvic floor therapy for this issue. And so it just kind of gets, plants the seed a little bit and can help them advocate for their stuff if they do decide to go. Um, what we have also done, um, and this was a lot of this was over the past year, is started offering online courses. So we have childbirth preparation, postpartum recovery, prolapse, diastasis, and these are very reasonably priced. They're like 40 bucks a course and we run sales all the time, but it's a way to get, you know, a lot of education in a small amount of time and at least help folks get started. And that is a very, very um, affordable rate. And, you know, we're softies at heart. And so always kind of have people emailing us with exceptions as well. But um, again, I think a way to make therapy more accessible. And then in addition, we just launched in 2021, a sliding scale and um, pro bono piece of our organization for online sessions and for in-person sessions. And, you know, for me specifically, this is a little bit of a different field than other types of physical therapy, but maternal health is really suffering in the United States. And I think that there's so much that we can do as physical therapists to help um, change that. And I really want my services, our services to be accessible and cost is a barrier. I mean, there's just no way around it. And so we have partnered with a lot of um, organizations in our community and just started saying, hey, you know, we are offering sight and skill services. Now you can apply. Um, and if you qualify, then that's it. It's free. You know, and we take so many at a time. So, you know, we are doing our piece, our part to try to um, create access to to this service. Keaton, did you want to go? Sure. Yeah, I spoke to it a little bit. So one is just streamlining insurance operations. So if we can utilize insurance in the cash-based model, I know it sounds ironic, but it is true. If we can optimize insurance for the patient, that is a huge financial consideration. Uh, number two is online classes. Agreed with Sarah. Uh, during the pandemic, Movement X started Age Proof Your Body. Um, and it's a nationwide exercise class for individuals 60 and over designed by physical therapists, nurses, personal trainers, and primary care doctors to help people prevent injury and age graceful, gracefully. So that's ageproofyourbody.com. Shameless plug. Um, the third one is looking at, you know, your cash-based rate is often significantly less than the fee schedule that in-network clinics set. So if somebody goes to the hospital, the fee for one hour is going to be maybe $330 on the high end. And if somebody has an outrageous deductible, they're paying a lot of money towards that deductible in network. Oftentimes a deductible cross accumulates in and out of network, which means you can pay our cash rate, which is half of what that in network cash rate is and still accumulate towards your deductible. So there are certain situations where it is cheaper to go out of network, not always, but definitely there, those do exist. Carlos, did you want to add anything there? Anything that your clinic has done to increase accessibility for patients? You are muted, just to let you know. Okay, good. Uh, apologies. So um, we have done a couple of the things that the ladies have discussed, uh, so I won't rehash those. Uh, one of the things that we do, actually two things that are kind of important, if this is a, a path you'd like to go down, and I've seen a couple questions and comments like, well, how do you set prices? And so uh, one thing that I tell people very commonly is, if your city has massage therapy, chiropractic care, acupuncturists, personal trainers, you can do this. You can essentially undercut every single one of those people and create a very powerful competitive lockout against anyone who appears to do work that is kind of like what you do. Um, so. Um, in our case, if we have personal training in the area and they charge, I mean, I charge much less for, for strength and conditioning and personal training services than a lot of the Gold's gyms do in the area. Um, but you can't really compare the kind of staff that I have as physical therapists and strength coach, uh, strength professionals doing what we do in our facility with the guys from Gold's. I mean, people at Gold's gym are terrific and they have a very 
interesting uh, niche built. But if you can come to us and see someone who's skilled in medicine and pain and movement pathology and all those other things, I mean, it's sort of a no brainer. So that's a great place to begin. Uh, the other thing that we did that is different is we have um, a consultation program. Essentially, uh, we give away care. Um, we say, okay, we set a very low number for um, a half an hour of our time. And I know that one of the things that's interesting, um, you got to feel sometimes what it is we do. You, you can't really, I mean, you can read about it online. You can, if your Instagram is ter terrific, I recommend everyone follow Sarah's Instagram. It's freaking awesome. Um, and there, you can get a lot of good information out to the public in that way. Um, but really it's about trust. Uh, when they come and see it, when they come and feel what it's like to have someone ask the right questions, uh, go further down the rabbit hole on someone's pain complaints, um, it's immediate that this whole thing is a higher value process. And so what we'll do is say, well, the, the consultation is $40. But if you get therapy, if you get any service from us in any way, we'll just credit that back to you and probably include a bunch of other things that we're always doing some kind of uh, plan of care special like Keaton discussed earlier. Um, you know, so if you buy your whole plan of care, it's gonna be less expensive um, than if you were to buy a session at a time. So those are two things that we're doing a little differently. Um, and of course, uh, the more ways that you can be agile and, and uh, aim the kind of um, meaningful price points or meaningful points of entry to your community or the people who make you want to get up and do this, the better. Go for it. So you kind of bled me to my next question, Carlos, yeah. but um, I guess, how do you determine your prices? Like, I think, one, I've seen prices all over the place um, for cash PTs and like, there's some people that want to base it off of insurance per se, um, but like, how how do you determine those prices? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I, I could touch on it because I think the way we did it was exactly in this way. Um, I was a personal trainer for 12 or 13 years before I even went to PT school. And I knew what I was charging people for 60 minutes of my time just to get them not fat. <laughs> so now you've had surgery, you have pain, you have something that's stopping you from doing the soul filling thing that you want to do. Well, this is a no brainer. And if you can go down the street at, you know, one of these gyms and get somebody to work up, work with you for an hour for $150, well, you'll pay me 110. So, I mean, it's one of the ways that we did it. And, and you know, no, it, you couldn't charge what we charge uh, everywhere, but that's okay because you don't need, frankly, to make what it is we make as a clinic everywhere either. Um, it really is dependent upon where you are. Um, so that's a big important bit. And that's how we kind of started our process with, with nailing down our price points. Sarah, what do you think? How did you kind of determine your prices? So similarly, I, I looked at other health practitioners in my area and I'm like, okay, people are charging a hundred dollars for an hour of yoga, which I love yoga, but I was like, yoga. I mean, <laughs> like we're special, you know, we could charge more. So I really started at a little bit of a lower rate. And then I started seeing what people all over the country were, were, um, were charging. And I was like, wow, that is really different and much higher than I was charging. So I kind of bumped it up a little bit. And every year I bumped it up $5, you know, and it's gone from 130 to 140 to 150 or something like that. And a big piece of me is people are like, you could charge more or you could charge more because we've had a long waiting list at, at, at many times. But again, I mean, I don't want to price out these services where only a certain percentage of the population can afford them. I want them to be accessible. And that's part of the reasons I keep my overhead low is because, you know, in my field, I don't need a ton of fancy equipment. I think that we can offer really good care with minimal supplies or a fancy setting and I want people to be able to access it. So, you know, I, I do think that we could charge more. I know we could, but I feel really comfortable with where we're at. And um, I've also done the same thing of implementing packages where if they buy four or six or however, or 10, they get kind of a discounted rate, but really looking at kind of what's in your area. And it's a little bit of trial and error. You're not going to hit it right on the head right away. And you kind of adjust. I mean, that's business. You're growing, you're changing, you're seeing what works and what doesn't. Keaton, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I would say, you know, set your rate, but don't set it too low. Like it is so much easier to lower your rate if you overshot than it is to increase your rate. When I very first started right on my own, my very first patient, I panicked. PTs are empathetic. We want to, you know, give away services. I set it at $100. 
I very quickly realized that <laughs> that, that was not going to work. Um, that, you know, so what, what I recommend is take what you want as a salary. And this is assuming you're operating solo with your own business. Take what you want with your salary. Calculate your overhead. Figure out how many patients a week you want to treat, which may be different if you have kids or are going to school or you know doing other extracurriculars. And then break it down by that, right? So what do you want your life to look like? What are your expenses? How much do you have to charge to get there? And then up at 25%. That's what we say for all of our PTs is set something that you think is reasonable and then up at 25% and make yourself uncomfortable. If you're getting absolutely no bites, it's not because of your price point, it's because of your confidence, 100%. If you are nervous about your price point and you tell people like, oh, it's a... <laughs> it's 175 it's 200 people are like oh i don't want to pay that you don't even want to charge that right so whatever you set as long as you're confident and demonstrating value people are going to pay it um so across movement x you know we have the east coast the west coast some midwest their prices do vary based on where you live and the surrounding environment but definitely push yourself a little bit yeah i think you all bring up really great points. Um, I mean, I remember first thinking about starting my own cash-based practice and someone was like, you could charge like $200 an hour. And I was like, there's no way, like who would <laughs> no?" And they were like, easy, like, especially if you want to go into pelvic health, easy. And I was just like, so blown away at that, at that number. And then, you know, kind of doing the math on like, okay, here's a typical salary. Um, for like a, a new grad PT in the St. Louis area, it's anywhere between like $55,000 to $70,000 a year. So not very much. And then you like kind of calculate it out. And I was like, wait, I'm making more money in the service industry per hour than I would take. Right. And so you're like, you're doing the math in your head and you're like, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, and then you see the cash PT side and you're like, okay, it makes more, it makes more sense now. Can I add something to that, Lindsay? Yeah. So a question that Vincent wrote on here. So this goes into it. So when you are calculating your cost of living and your overhead expenses, when you're starting your own business, um, you do have to account for things like healthcare, paying your own healthcare, which, you know, can be expensive. It varies based on, you know, politics, but basically you go to the healthcare care marketplace. There are healthcare representatives that are out there to help you find plans and they do it for free. Um, but the big thing I want to hit on is the higher self-employment tax. Uh, it's it's actually not that much higher because you can deduct everything. And so while you cannot deduct employee expenses in most cases, you just get that, what, 25 to 30 percent tax as a self-employed individual. You deduct your computer, your laptop, your home office, your cell phone, your pens and pencils, right, let alone your PT equipment. Um, your travel, your con ed. And so it actually brings the tax burden down quite a bit. Great advice. Great advice. Definitely something I would not have thought about. But that, yeah, that was actually my next question. Like, what do you do for benefits? What do you do for health insurance? Like, do you calculate in paid vacation days for yourself? Like, how does that, how does that work? <laughs> there, there's no such thing as paid vacation. Paid <laughs> vacation? What? <laughs> paid vacation and then let alone Crazy. vacation. <laughs> Adorable. Sorry. Um, I'll, I'll take that one. But um, yeah, I mean, if you have a partner who has health insurance, that's wonderful. If you are, you at least need two employees to help a, a health insurance plan for your organization. So, you know, I do offer health insurance to two of my employees because they needed it. And as healthcare provider, I felt like that was something that was really important for me to do. Um, or you can go on the health insurance exchange and get your own insurance, which a lot of entrepreneurs and self-employed people do. So that's um, not as difficult. I don't wouldn't say I have the most robust retirement plan starting out initially, but it's something that you build over time. You also have to factor in that you might not be taking a salary for a little while. So, you know, thinking about if you're planning on starting this up, I mean, saving up so that you have a means um, uh, to survive, to live without taking a salary in the very beginning. And you're not going to be making the salary in the beginning that you're going to be making two, three, four years down the line. So, um, you know, it is something that you have to, to be mindful of that you have a little bit of a cushion. But a lot of people, even myself, I was working at a hospital three days a week and then started this as a side gig. And as it got busier, I kind of whittled down my days at the hospital and then um, you know, started seeing more people at the yoga studio. So I'm, I would say I'm, I'm a little bit risk averse. I wasn't a dive right in person. I was 
slow and steady and, and wanted to feel like I was doing the right thing and still nervous. I mean, we're up here telling you how great it is, but we were all nervous. And, you know, you, we can't say that we weren't, but it's, um, we had a proof of concept and it was successful and we all clearly love what we do. And I think that, um, you know, we're here to tell you that it can totally be done. It's a lot of work and you don't get paid vacation. <laughs> I, uh, if, if I can real fast, um, thank you everybody, terrific answers. Um, there is a line from Jerry Maguire that I tell everyone who wants to know what it's like to be a cash practice owner. And it's a portion of the movie where he's in the locker room talking to Cuba Gooding Jr. He says, being your agent is an up at dawn, nerve wracking siege that I will not begin to describe to you. And that's an overstatement. However, this is not easier than going to work for someone else. It's different. It provides you different options. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do this yourself. You don't have to open a cash practice to have this kind of work life environment. You can hook up with somebody like Dr. Ray. You can hook up with somebody like Dr. Reardon and say, listen, I want to do this. I want to give value, but I don't know if I can stick my neck out that far. I have, I, I'm nervous. I'm risk averse. Uh, you know, I'm somewhat the other way. I leapt and the net appeared and that's kind of the way I've done it. Um, but in doing that, um, I was able to at least exemplify some of the confidence, whether or not it was backed by any amount of skill that Keaton talked about, um, that allowed me to grow and uh, be able to provide at least now for our team uh, many of the comforts that come from working at a very big place. So I thought it was important from the very beginning to provide medical benefits, retirement benefits, 529C, paid vacation con ed benefits, all those kinds of things, because I was sort of competing with a lot of the other big mills in our area for talent. Um, and it's real hard when you know, you're know you faced with, I can make 10 or 15% more right away and they wanna make me a clinic director in a year. By the way, that's not a promotion. So you all know that. Um, or you could work at this little place and have a mentor that's going to be looking out for you and looking to improve your skill and your clinical ability. Maybe one day you do break off and say, I want to do this myself. I pretty, I'm pretty, i pretty sure that the three of us talking right now would be ecstatic for one of our people to go and do something like that. Um, yeah, you'd, it would stink to be down a, a productive person. But you know, the more of us that are doing things like this, the way that I think we all went to school for, um, is be the better for the community, the better for uh, physical therapy in the whole, and the better for our patients. So, yeah. Oh, somebody asked, it's uh, McAllen 15. So you have to work in your scotch habit into your price point, just so you cover that up. Keaton, did you have anything to add in terms of benefits, health insurance, 401ks, anything like that? I totally forgot the question, so thanks for reminding me. Um, nothing to add, nope, I think it's totally doable. You know, you make, a sliver of what you bill in a traditional healthcare practice. So when Movement X was looking at how we're gonna pay our providers, uh, we flipped it on our head. So we actually pay our providers 70% of billables, whereas most outpatient orthopedic clinics pay about 30% maximum. So most likely you're taking home 20% of what you're billing on in your salary, which is horrible. And so all of that, of course, goes to paying the clinics overhead, the mortgage, the benefits, the admin staff, the billing system, the EMR. So when you're doing this on your own, your your percentage is so much higher. So things like healthcare and 401k, you have more bandwidth to actually contribute to those, especially if you're going solo. So it's totally doable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this question has come up a couple times um, in the chats and even a question myself, but how do you all do the marketing for your mm. practice and like kind of the, I should say behind the scenes work, but really it's the front line of, of your practice. Who's got it? Carlos, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I have a bad Instagram account. I have a poorly managed Facebook account. I have a very rudimentary website. <laughs> um, frankly, the way we have grown has been by people telling people. And so we have, um, really pressed our current client base to assist us in this. 
Uh, we always are trying to be creative with new events, new um, meet and greet, community uh, engagement kind of things. So uh, we've partnered with several different uh, charities. I'm a big dog lover, so we've partnered with a dog rescue. I um, enjoy scotch and beer, so we'll partner with different bars and doing you know fun events. Um, you know, burpees and beers, those kinds of things. And so really it's about community outreach for us. Um, I one day hope to be as uh, great at Instagram as Sarah is. I, <laughs> amazing at, at expanding the uh, physical network that Keaton has uh, built. Um, but right now, um, focusing on our community, focusing on, the, on, on our, um, our hell yeah people in our community that we wanna see day to day uh, and just trying to find ways to engage with them. Um, one-on-one -on -one is, is our, our strategy. Keaton, what do you guys do at Movement X? Because with a bunch of different clinics and different locations, I'm sure the marketing's got to be pretty big. Yeah, well, I'm really proud to say we've put zero dollars into marketing ever. So we've never purchased a Instagram ad. We've never paid for marketing uh, outside of, you know, like flyers. Um, but so it's all, I echo what Carlos said. It is 100% word of mouth and personal relationships. And so we don't have a standardized marketing approach in terms of one plus one equals two. It's how do you connect with your community? Are you part of a church group? Are you part of a local rec sports group? Do you have friends and family in the area? And then from there, do you have physician referrals? Do you have chiropractic referrals? Do you, you know, go knock on your neighbor's door and check in and see how they're doing? Because eventually your neighbors are going to have knee pain, right? And so 100% word of mouth is the way that we've grown and across all locations. I'm so glad I spent so much time on my marketing plan. <laughs> <laughs> when you said 150 grand, you were like, this is going to be a hard business. I was like, just don't do it. <laughs> no, no, no. This is all fictional. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah, what about you? Um, obviously your Instagram, I think. Right. So like, Instagram really started before I even had the practice. So that was something that, um, I wasn't even living in New Orleans at the time when I started it, but it's been great. I mean, and I, a lot of the community on there is outside of New Orleans. Um, you know, again, I echo what uh, Carlos and Keaton said. I mean, we are the boots on the ground. So we do, you know, um, little insert free in services after a yoga class, after a prenatal fitness workout, after a mommy and me workout. Um, I like to meet with not just for even my own marketing, but to know who the referrals are in my community, acupuncturists, chiropractors, doulas, um, nutritionists, like those are the people I want to refer to because I need them as well um, just to recommend to clients. So it's a great way to build rapport. And then hands down, I mean, word of mouth is the most um, valuable referral that you can get. And so again, it, it kind of all ties back to what we mentioned earlier in the program is that you do an amazing job and people will sing your praises for you. Um, I also recommend getting Google reviews, which are also free. I email patients after they were discharged and just say, such a pleasure working with you. Do you mind writing a review for us? And so that just helps bump up your SEO and it's free marketing. Definitely. Um, we have just, we're like almost out of time here. So we have a few more questions that I wanted to get to, but being where you are now, what do you wish you would have known before you started your practice, before you kind of got involved in all of this? Keaton, you look like you have a lot. Well, I'm just having so much fun reading these questions on the side. They're, they're great. I love it. They're so good. I want to answer all of them. Uh, but some, some of these questions are like, nuance, like super, super specific. And I would say, don't worry about it if you haven't started your practice yet. Now, if you have a functioning practice and you're just worrying about this one little thing, great. But if you're driving yourself crazy over some of these little details and you haven't started yet, you're going to go insane. So Oprah, you know, she has this awesome talk, another podcast I'll send you guys about um, failure. And she always says, if somebody, if she had been told how much work being Oprah was, she would have never done it. So she always asked herself, what is the best next step? And just do that. And once you've done that, then do the best next step from there. So don't worry how many lines of documentation you need to do first to get your first patient. Then figure out how much to charge them then figure out where to document them, then figure out how to document it, right? You can't figure it all out in the beginning. We do have answers to all those things. And so maybe we'll do a 2.0 live, but <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It can be very overwhelming just one step at a time. Sarah, what do you wish you would have known before you started your practice? 
Um, so I think for me, I actually, there was a time, I mean, I'm very ambitious and I was actually doing too much. And I started my own personal health care started suffering. I started having migraines. Like professionally, I was doing amazing and it was visible. But I think behind the scenes, I really wasn't taking care of myself and um, really had to have a reckoning about like, I can't continue at this pace and that I want to be the best at everything, but really slow and steady is going to be a better pace for me than trying to like knock it out of the park and have five clinics in five years. So, you know, it's a little bit of trying to remind myself, like, why did I get into this so I could have more balance, so I could have more time with my kids, so I could offer a great quality of care. And I was burning myself out more than when I was working at, you know, a, a hospital clinic. And so really just knowing that um, to take my time with it, I, I think we're really hard on ourselves. And, um, you know, that was a big one. And then the other thing, I don't think we had the foresight to see that COVID was going to happen, that we were going to shut our clinics down for a month. So it goes back to like, keep your overhead low. I'm glad I don't have three clinics that I have to support the leases on and 12 employees. Like I like, I want it to be small and intimate and I don't want to have this huge thing that I'm me personally. So, um, you know, I think just knowing how to be flexible, pivot when you need to, and um, just making sure that we don't kind of burn ourselves out um, in just another way. Carlos, what about you? Yeah, I'm probably going to mirror what Sarah was talking about, but just keep it real concise. Um, Self-care is big. Um, the, the grind that this can be, uh, especially early on, is somewhat overwhelming. I mean, if we really gave the, oh God, the staring at the ceiling up late at night story of just dread when you don't know if you've got it for the next week, the next month, the next quarter, that is terrifying. Um, but again, it's not to turn people off. It's just to get people to understand that it's um, um, you need to build in the kinds of things that fill your own bucket, uh, heal your own soul. So those things should not go to the wayside. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a very supportive uh, wife and family. Um, uh, I do want to save someone some money. Somebody asked if you need legal Zoom. Don't buy the legal Zoom. Never ever use legal Zoom for anything at all. Don't do it. So. That's the short I'm going to give in that. You can do anything Legal Zoom does, just searching the internet for like pennies on the dollar. So, but yes, as far as um, self care, I wish I knew that better because I probably would um, not have had a lot of a lot more of the rough, uh, depressive, anxious nights that I had early on. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I have one final question before we um, end our conversation. It's been really great. And I think a lot of people have enjoyed it, have gotten a lot out of it. It looks like people are even looking for an APCA Live 2.0 on this. So who knows? Um, but my final question is, what has been the best part about starting your cash PT practice? Like, when you think back on all of the work you've put in, all of the sleepless nights, all of the hours, what is the best part that is absolutely going to stick with you? Carlos, do you want to start there? Sure. I'm just proud. I'm so proud. I'm proud of the team I have built. I'm proud of the facility that we have. Um, uh, I was told hundreds of times, you cannot do this. People have insurance and they will desire to use it. You cannot scale. You will never have a team. You will never have a facility. You will never have equipment. Uh, it'll just be you with a bed in your car. And so I, that just drives me, man. I, I love when people tell me that stuff. It's like, okay, just watch me then. And uh, I just have great pride in the kind of things that we've done and the people um, we serve. Uh, frankly, if it wasn't for the kind of culture that we have built and the people we have seen over the last 12 years, we wouldn't have survived COVID. Um, and it's just for those people that um, we're still here. And so I'm very proud of it. And that's uh, building that community is probably the thing I'm most proud of. I love that. Keaton? What's been the best part for you? Very similar. The the people, 100%. You know, we are so fortunate. We've been asked to have this community of employees and contractors. We have, I think our team, including employees and contractors, is about 45 now across the U.S. And so we've had, you know, faculty who are brilliant at a certain technique. We've had people who are on their third career. We have people who um, you know, started their own practices, run them for 25 years, and then joined Movement X to continue on their career. We have new grads. We have 
we have so many different types of people and every single day we're learning from these specialists across the country. So if anyone here wants to join our team and that last shameless plug, I promise uh, we are always looking for people who are actively treating cash-based clinicians to join our team or who are very serious about starting to do so. So please reach out. We're happy to speak with you, but people, the people you surround yourself with are everything. Common theme. <laughs> I love it. Sarah, what about you? What's been the best part? So I think for me, it's, you know, I really think about kind of just the ripple effect that our work does. And, you know, we are such a niche practice of pelvic health. And I really am so hopeful that we are just changing the way that people see this, you know, that it's, um, I think sometimes it's scary or it's weird or um, they're just not getting good quality of care. It's just Kegels and biofeedback and that is not the case. And so I really hope that we can change the way that we are taking care of people and prevent issues for pelvic floor, um, for the pelvic floor down the line and just really having a huge effect. Um, you know, maybe it's, we're so small, but I just, um, I love what I do. I love the team that we have. I'm incredibly grateful for it. Um, but the best part is just thinking a little bit of like, wow, we could, we're really making a difference here. And um, that to me is what like, uh, all the hard, depressive, anxious nights, it's like, okay, we're doing the right thing because we are literally changing the quality of life for people. And that is the most rewarding thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I bring it back to what I said at the beginning, where students entered this field, this profession, because they wanted to provide the best quality care. No one entered this profession thinking like, I'm going to have 15 minutes with a patient or like, I'm going to be so burnt out that I can't even see my family or, you know, have time to to really give what I want to the patient. So I wanted to just say thank you all so much for joining us tonight. It has been a fantastic discussion. I think a lot of people got so much out of it, whether you are a student or you're a practicing clinician, a PT, PTA. Um, if we did not get around to your question, please feel free to reach out and contact our guests. All of their contact information, their emails will be included in the comments below. So feel free to reach out to them. They're also all on Instagram. Um, so again, reach out to them if you didn't get your question answered. And thank you all again for joining us for APTA Live Student Night.